Welcome to Echoes International Podcast, with teaching, interviews and stories of what God is doing straight from the mission field and also within the UK. For more podcasts, stories and opportunities to get involved, check out our website at echoesinternational.org.uk and our other social media channels. Thank you, Richard. Uh, pleasure to be here with you today. It's been a long day. I'm sure you're tired and I don't want to um, um, tie you any further, but I do want you to look at the Bible if you've got one. Uh, I want to uh, look at Isaiah and chapter 58, and if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to it with me. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to read a few initial verses, and then we will dip into this chapter together. Uh, Isaiah 58, I'm reading from verse 1 in the ESV. Cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, and when you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Helen Roosevelt was a missionary in Congo, and she said that the 58th chapter of Isaiah was the most shattering chapter in the Bible because it gets to the heart of what really matters to God. And it reveals his strategy for effective mission in our culture today. Mission doesn't start when you step off a plane or a boat in a foreign culture. Mission starts when you step out your front door, the front door of your life. What I want to leave you with is the challenge I've received as I've read this chapter afresh for myself. Because yes, I want to leave that challenge to pray, that challenge to give, that challenge to go. But the bigger challenge for all of us is the challenge to be. The challenge of us to be missionaries in the place where God places us. And as this chapter unfolds, we'll see we're going to be effective in, uh, if we're going to be effective in our mission, then there are barriers that need to be removed. And I've picked out three that surfaced in this chapter, barriers that often stand in the way of people hearing and receiving the gospel that God has entrusted us with. The first one is seen in the opening uh, verses of the chapter that we read, and it's what I call a religious hypocrisy. The historical context for Isaiah's prophecy has been much debated, and he appears to be speaking both about the Assyrian and the Babylonian exile. And you can read more about that, of course, in the historical uh, books of Kings and Chronicles. But in both cases, God's chosen people were merely paying lip service to their faith. The reality was far different. And these opening verses are a kind of mirror image of the opening chapter of the book of Isaiah, where God's saying to his people, yes, I see what you're doing, I hear what you're saying, but your walk does not match your talk. The opening chapter is... Uh, Basically saying to them, I don't want you to bring your burnt offerings, your worthless sacrifices. I want you to forget about your fasting and your pious meetings or your solemn assemblies. He says, that's not what I'm interested in. You're doing 
the outward expression, but the reality is different. What I want you to do is to learn to do good, to seek justice, to help the oppressed, to defend the orphan, and to fight for the right of widows. Something very practical in your religion. You see, these opening verses unfold by describing a religiosity that had the external, but the heart did not mirror what they were expressing. And so they were fasting. They were making sacrifices. But in going to their equivalent of church faithfully, carrying the equivalent of a big Bible faithfully, talking the talk religiously, maybe tithing their money, saying their prayers, but in their home and in their workplace, they were different people. I was really shocked and disappointed to hear the other day of a Christian lawyer in Brethren Assembly who for many years attended regularly, faithfully, but was later discovered to have defrauded one of his clients of thousands and thousands of pounds. It just struck me how easy it is to appear to be the right thing. But Isaiah puts his finger on the root problem uh, in verse 3, he repeated in verse 13, and that was their, their selfish pursuit. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. Uh, we're living in uh, what's called the selfie generation, aren't we? Um, the, the me too, well, the, the, the me only generation. That's what was happening here, where that in turn was accompanied by critical and careless speech, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of wickedness, talking idly. No wonder people reject the gospel that we preach if they hear what, what James in the New Testament calls the deadly poison that often comes from people's mouths. He says, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. Now, I don't want to do what Isaiah is doing and point the finger at others because I'm challenged by these verses. We've got a, a neighbor's war going on in our neighborhood at the moment. It all came out over the Queen's um, Jubilee when we had a party, it was a great party, but the aftermath has been neighbors not talking to neighbors. And uh, it's very easy to get sucked into it and to find yourself criticizing one neighbor to another neighbor. And God has convicted us that what we say with our mouths needs to be very carefully monitored because the way we live our lives in front of those that are our neighbors either opens or closes the door for the gospel that we preach, which uh, quickly leads me to the heart of this chapter, and that is there is a broken world that needs to be restored, and uh, we've heard so much about that in those uh, exciting reports we've heard today, but verses 6 and 7, you can read there, is the the heart of what Isaiah is saying, this is, this is really what it's all about. Letting the oppressed go free. Sharing your bread with the hungry, the homeless poor into your house. You see, our mission is captured by these two um, complementary roles of releasing the captives and bringing relief for the destitute. That's both on a social and a spiritual level. I've really loved reading the book that uh, Jim recommended for us this morning. If you haven't bought it yet, please do. Footsteps worth following. I took it on holiday uh, with me this year, and uh, I've been trying to read a, a few uh, stories every night uh, when I go to bed. It's been thrilling. Just uh, I couldn't put it down. And uh, it just describes, as it's peppered throughout, with the multifaceted face of mission around the world down through the years and all of them contributing to the restoration of a broken world. I was impressed with Richard Hill in 1916. 
The story uh, uh, describes him providing clothing and bedding and fuel and food to 20,000 Armenian refugees and setting up sewing stations to provide them with employment. Then I read of Tim and uh, Jenny Gooding in Romania uh, who were refused permission to open a children's home which they thought the Lord was um, calling them to open but God turning it round and uh, turning it into what they describe as a place for the many cancer patients who come from all over Romania for radiotherapy and chemotherapy treatments at a local clinic. What a wonderful way of what they thought was a closed door becoming a different open door. God often does that, doesn't he? And then the story of Sterling in the Havens Christian Rehab program in Nassau, Bahamas. Most of his life he'd lived on the city dump as a scavenger. His life of crime fueling his addiction to drugs and alcohol. But here in this picture you see him leading uh, a Bible study group uh, with some other addicts as he helps to lead this uh, rehab program himself. And then I was impressed by Charles Marsh speaking in Arabic to 40 Muslim prisoners in Chad where he writes, one Muslim rose and before all said uh, he could understand the shallowness uh, of Islam and he accepted Christ as his saviour. We've heard a lot about prison ministry today, release for the captives and relief for the destitute. That's what it's about. And if you flick on your Bibles a few chapters, you discover the mission of Jesus encapsulated in his manifesto, chapter 60, 61. Uh, what does he say? The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And the mission hasn't changed, has it? His mission is our mission today. There are going to be a lot more poor in our communities in these coming days. Uh, Britain is going to face some of those issues that we've heard about in other countries. I'm sure of that. We need to help people practically and spiritually. Sharing our bread with the hungry, what does that mean? Well, we can find creative ways. You may come today and you think, well, what can I do? How can I help the poor? How can I share my bread with the hungry? In different ways people are hungry. My wife um, doesn't like speaking in public very much, but she's got a quiet way of sharing her faith. And uh, uh, over the past few months, particularly with uh, the epidemic, we've discovered more and more neighbours who are lonely and shut in. In fact, our, our whole cul-de-sac is like geriatricsville. It's, um, you know, <laughs> uh, people who are much older than us. I'm glad to say uh, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting there. Um, and an uh, 87-year-old uh, widowed neighbor, lovely lady, but very lonely. It's the epidemic of our society today. And uh, Maureen's been just befriending her, uh, baking cakes for her and then inviting her into our home on a regular basis just to give her a place to talk, to befriend her. She's hungry, but she's hungry for company. Uh, she seems to be hungry for cake as well and seems to appreciate it. So sharing your bread or your cake with the hungry and practical ways of just reaching out with your love to your neighbours, those in society as we try to rebuild those broken walls. Isaiah promises that when we get involved in God's mission to a broken world, then thirdly, there are blessings that wait to be received. And I summarize them under three headings. Our light will shine. Verse 8, your light will shine, break forth like the dawn. Verse 10, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. This is not just the light of his glory in verse 8, 
But the light of his guidance in verse 11, um, these verses are describing a life of communion and intimacy with the Lord. And it goes on to reflect a satisfied, fragrant, abundant life supplied by the Lord. Verse 11, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. I had the privilege of growing up in a missionary family myself. And uh, in those early days, meeting many missionaries who passed through our home in Portugal. Missionaries destined for other lands like uh, Angola and Mozambique and uh, uh, Brazil and other places. And uh, as a child, I was just so impressed by the light shining from their faces, the reality of uh, their lives. And uh, I recall a number in particular who would share their stories of, uh, yes, sun-scorched places in Africa and other places where just their practical Christian ministry just made such an impact. And I'm sure they were, they certainly were to me like a watered garden. I'm sure they were out in those sun-scorched places as they brought the light of the gospel of Jesus just by the way they lived their lives. Yes, our lives will make that impact. Our light will shine, our prayers will work. Verse 9, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Sometimes that takes protracted amount of crying as Alex shared and our last session with the men, but prayer does work. And there are some some wonderful testimonies in that book of uh, answered prayer. One that struck me in particular was Peter Headley's story faced with a £20,000 expense in a children's home in Albania, only for complete strangers to visit and without knowing of the needs, say that the Lord had impressed upon them to give the figure of £20,000. Never met them before, never never met them since. God provides, and as Peter Hedley wrote, he says God's work, done in God's way, will never lack God's supply. Maybe sometimes our prayers don't work because those barriers have not yet been removed from our lives. And finally, the reality is that when mission happens, our society will prosper. And so although verse 12 would appear to anticipate the nation returning from Babylon, the fact is that when we engage in God's mission, we're doing what it says in verse 12, we're raising up the foundations of future generations. We will be repairers of the breaches that exist in human relationships, people with each other, and particularly people with God himself. And by the gospel being preached and shown and lived, we will be exercising a positive influence on society, light and salt, We may even impact the economics of where we live as we bring the light of the gospel into our dark culture. You say, is this a gospel, a social gospel that you're advocating? Well, yes, because the gospel needs to transform society. And as it transforms people, it will transform society. Some of you remember the work done by the Message Trust in Manchester and that wonderful story of uh, how they had a mission and during the whole week of mission uh, a crime filled area a particular estate in uh, in Manchester saw no crime whatsoever and the police have reported how ever since the crime statistics have uh, nosedived because of what the church was doing in that particular part of Manchester the gospel makes a difference when we live it out and people see that light shining from us. And so the final promises in verse 14 have a special reference, yes, to Israel, but who else could I quote 
at an ECHOES conference other than W.E. Vine. And this is what he says. He says, for us, it speaks of our possessions with Christ in the heavenly places. These spiritual blessings are our present possession and are realizable according as we renounce worldly advantages, taking up our cross daily and following Christ. Do we need to remove some of the barriers to sharing the gospel in our community? Do we need to play our part more intentionally in restoring a broken world, starting where God's placed us, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace? If we do, then there will be blessing and his kingdom will come. God bless you. We hope you're encouraged and inspired and ready to answer the call. Thank you for listening.